Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, appreciate you showing up uh, for this, our second uh, tech talk uh, that Ribbon is, uh, is putting out. The goal of these talks is really to cover the basic technologies, uh, the foundational technologies, if you will, uh, of transport networks, uh, and to try and unravel and uh, clear away some of the uh, the obscurity, the the uh, obfuscation, the mist, if you will, uh, around these things. Um, they're really pretty straightforward, and DWDM is is really among the the easiest of the technologies to to understand. So let's uh, let's just dive right into it. So the first question is why? Why do we use DWDM? As you may be aware, DWDM stands for Dense Wave Division Multiplexing, a very fancy term that simply means what you're looking at on the screen. We've all seen this experiment, uh, you know, in elementary school where you have a glass prism and a flashlight and you put white light in one side of that glass prism and you get multiple colors on the other side. Uh, it, it's fun. It's colorful. It's you know, it's science. Uh, well, that's all DWDM is, right? Uh, aside from the obvious references to Pink Floyd's uh, record-breaking album, uh, this is uh, a, a, is a great description, uh, a, a visual description of DWDM. DWDM is a very simple technology, as as uh, illustrated here. Uh, we use it for fiber relief, meaning. Uh, where you've got too few strands of fiber in the ground, but you have a need for uh, a lot of uh, transport uh, over that particular span. Uh, we can also use it for traffic isolation, and I'll go into that here in a moment. Uh, and it's also a very efficient means of transport. And when I mean efficient, I mean it can go long, it can go far, uh, it can go wide, and it can do that more cost effectively than virtually any other technology out there. OK, so a number of reasons why DWM is so prevalent out there um, to move away from a flashlight and a glass prism and start using some DWM technology. The white light coming in on the left hand side of the screen is, in effect, multiplexed wavelengths. Now, this is what we see out in the world and not just in DWM environments. When you see white light, what you're seeing is multiple colors multiplex together. The prism splits out each one of those wavelengths into a discrete wavelength. Now we call those colors. Uh, we have other names for them uh, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but you know colors is good enough for now or wavelengths. Each one of these wavelengths is capable of carrying a data stream all on its own as if each wavelength were a virtual pair of fibers. So the benefits here start to become really obvious that if I can have a red wavelength, an orange one, a yellow one, a green one, a blue one, and a purple one, each one carrying a 10 gig, a 100 gig, a 200 gig, you can see how I can carry a heck of a lot more on a single pair of fiber uh, than I could with, uh, with non-DWDM light. Okay, so uh, don't be afraid. This is going to look a lot like science, but I'm, I'm going to simplify this for you. Um, what you're looking at on the left hand side is the entire what what uh, physicists call the electromagnetic spectrum. Right. And we've all heard about this. Right. Gamma rays, radiation uh, on the left hand side, uh, AM radio on the right hand side. Right. And everything in between. You'll note that very little of this is actually visible to our eyes. Right. Uh, some of it is radio waves, so we, we use that to transmit uh, data over the air. Uh, X-rays, of course, have their uses, uh, infrared, but all of these fit on this spectrum, right, from very short wavelengths to very long wavelengths on the right-hand side. Visible light fits in this little bitty slice right here between the ultraviolet and the infrared. The DWDM spectrum covers a part of this as well and its place in the em spectrum is recognized by this blue line here right uh, fitting within the infrared so 
technically all DWDM light is within the infrared part of the spectrum, okay? So it's very well defined. The industry has defined the wavelengths uh, and the frequencies uh, that we can transmit light uh, very specifically. And you're looking at the table uh, here in white and yellow on the right-hand side. Uh, there will not be a quiz later for this. The point here is uh, to take away is that the C-band spectrum is defined down to one one hundredth of a nanometer. So it's very, very precise. And no matter which vendor is producing the DWDM optics or filters or what have you for your network, we all use the C-band primarily for data transmission. And so channel 33 on the C-band means the same thing to every single vendor. It's a standard, okay? Um, the other way to think about the C-band is in terms of uh, that you've got a, a limited amount of spectrum, like the blue line on my diagram here, and each, each segment of that spectrum can be split like a slice of a pie. So if you think of that well-defined segment of the spectrum as a pie, okay? And we can't have any more pie, right? Because the industry has defined that spectrum, right? You can't go any further towards ultraviolet or towards the uh, radio bands. All you have is what you have. So uh, the pie analogy works. And so that pie is split into individual channels. Or if you look at the bottom of my slide here, channels also means wavelength, also means some people call them rails, uh, colors, lambdas, all of these terms mean exactly the same thing, okay? Here, I'm kind of using the word slice, which we don't use for DWDM, but I'm using it because I've got a, a pie analogy going here, right? So stick with me. So if I have a pie, which represents the entire spectrum that I can use for DWDM, then I can technically split that into as many slices as I want. So the way the industry has decided to split it up is with slices that are either 100 gigahertz in size or 50 gigahertz in size. So 100 gigahertz is a bigger pie slice, 50 gigahertz is a smaller pie slice. Now, because this is physics, you don't get something for nothing, right? So uh, with the larger pie slices, uh, with 100 gigahertz, channels you can support with current technology up to 400 gig on that wavelength okay uh, uh, and so i can do technically i can do 48 channels uh at 100 gigahertz in size and each one of those can carry 400 gig okay now if i split that pie into instead of uh, uh, 48 pieces if I split it into 96 equal pieces. Well, now I have a lot more pieces, uh, a lot more slices, more channels, more wavelengths that I can use each one to carry data. But because I have used the same spectrum and cut it up to smaller wavelengths, right, smaller channels, now I can only do 200 gig, right? So again, it's physics. Uh, if you use wider channels, you can carry more data. Uh, if you need more channels, then you can split it into more channels, but then each channel can only carry uh, up to 200 gig, right? So this is just an example. There are many ways to split this pie. These are the most common. Uh, when we design a network, uh, these are the ones that we typically look at. Uh, with the advent of uh, technology, uh, 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 newer technologies, and the really massive uh, uh, scalability of uh, lasers, transmission lasers, and so forth, we start looking at the 48 channel, 100 gig slices, uh, because if you could build a network that'll do 400 gig, then why not, right?
typically uh, that that is uh, more than enough for uh, any of our customers out there. So this is just an idea to give you an idea uh, to give you a sense of that spectrum and how it can be sliced uh, to carry data on discrete channels. So some other characteristics of light transmission. These are all things that we have to keep track of uh, when we are using DWDM light uh, to transmit data. Optical power. Well, this is uh, just the brightness of the light. Uh, it's measured in, in decibels. Each one of these lasers is tuned, as I mentioned, to a very specific wavelength, down to one one hundredth of a nanometer. Okay. Um, uh, another way to describe optical power is uh, just how bright your flashlight is, right? And you have to have a certain amount of brightness, if you will, to get from point A to point B, okay? Um, if you walk outside at night with a typical flashlight, even a powerful one, of course, you can shine it across the street at your neighbor's house. Uh, you can shine it down the block. But at a certain point, the light disperses and you can't see your flashlight shining on anything, right? Well, that's the light dispersing in air, which is the media that you're transmitting it across, okay? Well, we use glass fiber to transmit laser light in much the same way, simply because that glass fiber preserves the uh, transmission power much better than air or any other uh, media does. Uh, but it still attenuates that signal. In other words, over distance, that signal will still get dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. And so uh, those numbers, how dim the light gets over distance is a known quantity, right? The typical fiber out there is what we call SMF28 fiber. It loses a quarter of a dB uh, per kilometer, right, by default. Sometimes a little better, sometimes a little worse, but that's in general, uh, the attenuation effect of fiber. Well, with all of that known, we can program and determine exactly how much amplification and how much launch power we need to put into a laser so that it will get from point A to point B, whether A to B is 10 kilometers, 40 kilometers, 80 kilometers, or beyond, right? So all of that is calculated uh, ahead of time when we're engineering a network. Uh, down below, chromatic dispersion. This is the effect of different wavelengths of light attenuating and uh, dying off, if you will, getting dimmer as they go through the fiber at different rates. So uh, if you think back to the glass uh, prism and you had red, uh, orange, yellow, green, and so forth, if you think about those different wavelengths, each, you know, one is a little better at going further down the down the fiber path. Uh, others are not quite so good, and so they die off sooner. So we have to correct for that. Uh, so there is a uh, a known factor at which these uh, these different uh, wavelengths uh, will uh, uh, disperse as they go down fiber, and so we naturally correct for that in the initial engineering phase. Uh, we're also looking at signal to noise ratio. This is simply, uh, you know, noise is always and ever present, right? There's always going to be backscatter and other disruptions. Uh, you know, what you hear when you're li listening to the radio late at night uh, is static, right? Which is caused by atmospheric effects, other channels, who knows, right? All sorts of noise out there. When you turn your dial and you hone in on that station, you are improving the signal to noise ratio so that you can better hear the, the station that you want to listen to. It works the same way with light, right? So we're always looking at the strength of our signal versus the background noise. Uh, and then down at the bottom, there is another dispersion type, which is polarization mode. Uh, there's not a whole lot you can do to correct for that um, other than using good fiber, right? Uh, we can, if you have more questions about that, we can, we can talk about it, but we generally don't look at it when we are correcting uh, and designing a network up front. Uh, there is a certain amount of tolerance uh, that our optics uh, will absorb in terms of uh, polarization dispersion. Uh, but, you know, once your fiber uh, 
uh, has been affected by PMD, then then uh, it, it's something that we have to we have to look at more drastic measures to correct. Uh, on the bright side, it's very rare to see that. Okay. Uh, if you're taking notes at home, these are some of the more common optical network elements. So amplifiers, uh, we put these in on virtually every fiber span in a, a design engineered network, uh, and they're exactly what, what they sound like. What we're doing is we're taking that initial laser and we're amplifying it, a known quantity, so that it will be exactly the right brightness when it, it reaches its termination point, right? So there is a, a sweet spot of optical power where if you have uh, light that's brighter than that sweet spot, brighter than the receiver uh, is, is designed to accept, then you'll, you'll blind that receiver and you will get no data, right? Uh, if on the other hand, if your light isn't bright enough and it's below that sweet spot, uh, then again, you're not getting data. And so we have to amplify it uh, within a range to exactly uh, the, the uh, parameters that are defined by, uh, uh, by the receiving hardware, okay? Um, filters, filters are the glass prisms, okay? The glass prism in the, in the very first slide, uh, that's what a filter is. Uh, another word for it is a photom, uh, a mux de mux shelf. Uh, these are, uh, they're all terms for basically a, a passive, uh, in many cases, a one rack unit passive device, uh, which is gonna have multiple pairs of LC connectors on the front of it, uh, where you plug in your, your uh, outside plant fiber and your, uh, your discrete fibers. Um, and inside, uh, it is a completely passive device. Inside, it really is just mirrors, right? Uh, and, and what it's doing is it's taking that white light and it is splitting it into multiple wavelengths, right? So you can pull the data off the red wavelength and off orange and off yellow and so forth, okay? Uh, a rotom is an optical switch. Uh, it is a configurable, configurable optical switch that basically detects incoming traffic uh, to a particular site and then decides, is this traffic for my site or does it need to pass through and keep going? Um, it's a very useful uh, device. And in fact, uh, we build very few networks today that don't have rotoms on them. Uh, not only does it uh, handle the traffic uh, coming in and either dropping or continuing down the line, but it also handles all of the uh, optical balancing that needs to happen, right? So optical power, it works with amplifiers to adjust optical power. Um, it, uh, it balances uh, uh, gain and tilt adjustments. Uh, it basically is an automatic transmission, if you will, for all of the different optical parameters that I discussed on the last slide. Uh, and it manages all of those for you. So uh, once we design a network for you with rotoms and amplifiers in it, all you have to do to turn up new channels in the future is plug in cards on each side and optics and the rotom and the amplifiers handle everything else. So it's basically one engineering uh, session at the very beginning when it's built, and after that, it's plug and play. Uh, the optic, the pluggable optic, the laser, the transceiver, these are all different names for the same thing, right? Uh, and they're these, you, you know, most of you know them as SFPs. There are many form factors today, QSFPs, CFPs, CFP2s and so forth. Uh, they're always coming up with new ones, more powerful, go further, uh, more bandwidth, and then the physical form factor is smaller. I don't know how much smaller we're gonna get them because we're now limited by human fingers, right? We could technically build one that's extraordinarily small, uh, but then we couldn't get in there to plug them and unplug them, right? So we're, we're probably about as small as we're gonna be able to get those the pluggable uh, uh, physical units. Uh, so the optics, uh, we've been talking about DWDM, but uh, most of you, I'm sure, are familiar with what we call gray wave uh, uh, transmission as well. These are your 1310 and 1550, uh, also 850 nanometer optics. Uh, you'll notice when you order these that they're much, much cheaper uh, than, uh, than DWDM optics. That's because 
These are designed typically to be uh, to transmit and receive within tens of nanometers, whereas DWDM optics are are precise down to one one hundredth of one nanometer, right? So orders of magnitude more precise for DWDM. The purpose of that is because we are putting multiple wavelengths on one pair of fiber. With the gray wave fibers, all you can do is put one on there. You've got one wavelength on there because it's basically got a spotlight, right? And it's taking up all of the available spectrum uh, across that, that fiber, uh, the, the 850, 1310, 1550s, right? So it's gonna blind any receiver to any other wavelength. DWDM, not so much because it is so precise that I can put multiple wavelengths on a fiber, and because they're so precise, they never interfere with each other, right? As far as each wavelength is concerned, it's the only one on that fiber, right? Sort of the secret behind uh, uh, DWDM. So here's simple point-to-point -point operation for DWDM. Uh, I have two glass prisms now. The other word for these is filter or photom, uh, fixed optical add drop multiplexer, um, a mux demux shelf. Again, they're just they're just passive filters. Okay, so this is what a simple solution would look like. On one side, you have discrete, like on site A, you've got discrete wavelengths. So each one of these colors, if you will will plug into a different line card. So one of them may be carrying OC48, one of them may be carrying 10 gig, uh, 100 gig, 200 gig. It's up to you what you put on that individual wavelength. The filter combines them all together and they all run over outside plant fiber uh, as multiplexed, uh, you might call it white light, but it's multiplexed light. Then it, when it's received at site B, the reverse happens. The, the filter splits each one out discreetly. And so now my OC48 drops out to its own line card, my one gigs, my 10 gigs, 100 gigs, 200 gigs, and so forth, right? Now, typically we don't run sub rate or very small uh, uh, data across its own individual channel because that would be a waste, right? These days we rarely build a network that's less than 100 gig per channel, right? Um, but there are cards that will combine multiple, uh, if you still have some Sonnet, it will combine multiple OC3s, OC12s, OC48s, 10 gigs, 40 gigs, what have you, up into that 100 gig wavelength, right? So we can do that multiplexing for you. Um, you can run individual 100 gigs over your DWDM uh, environment. Uh, so if one of your neighbors or, uh, you know, a, a large provider comes through and says, I'd like you to backhaul 100 gig through your territory, you can, de you can designate a wavelength for that, right? Uh, and carry it uh, just as, as if you were giving them a pair of dark fiber. Uh, and that's really at the, at the economic level. Uh, not only is this the most efficient way to do it for your own traffic, but uh, selling wave services, uh, leasing wavelengths to, uh, to your customers uh, is a much more efficient way to do things uh, and a much better cost recovery method uh, than leasing them or selling them dark fiber, right? It's your fiber, hang on to it, put DWDM in and give them a wavelength instead. So this is uh, the, the general process that we go through when we're designing a network, right? So the, the great news about all of the physics I just gave you um, is that we do it, we, we do all the heavy lifting, right? More than happy to walk you through how it all works in detail, uh, but, uh, but our job uh, it is to handle all of that physics for you uh, and then guarantee that the network's gonna work, right? So the inputs to this process, excuse me, the inputs to this process are a network topology map, right? What sites do you have out there? What fiber do you have between them? What kind of fiber is it? Uh, if you have OTDR shots, if you have characteristics of that fiber, uh, that's good to know. How long is that fiber? Critical to know that because as I mentioned before, light will dim and attenuate over distance on fiber. And so 
uh, so we need to know that. But that's a, that's a, uh, the first input. Then how do you want your traffic to run? If you have a ring, which is very common, uh, do we want to use that ring to protect traffic, right? Sort of a, a working and a protect route. If you have more complex topologies, um, you know, a full mesh, a partial mesh, then how do you want your traffic to flow uh, around that network? Uh, are we looking at layer one only optical design? Uh, are we gonna be putting layer two or layer three traffic on this network? These are all things that, uh, that again, go into the basic design. Uh, what type are the sites, right? Do you have sites that are just gonna be passed through uh, and you're never gonna drop traffic there? Or do you have sites that are gonna be a hub uh, where we need to put a larger chassis because they're going to support maybe your internet, uh, your internet uplinks, uh, multiple uh, other uh, meet me points with uh, with other customers uh, and so forth, um, or is it a small site, a small site that's never going to get above, you know, say a thousand customers, right? Uh, all of those go into the design as well. So once we have those raw, the raw data, if you will, of the first three points here. Then we start looking at uh, building the optical network. Uh, we put the optical elements in. Once those are in place, we simulate it and then qualify that network. Uh, what that means is we uh, have done the math and the physics to ensure that based upon the inputs that this network's gonna work for you, right? And we guarantee that, right? Uh, again, as I mentioned before, the network uh, design really only has to be done once, uh, and after that, it's plug and play. Um, if uh, the only exception to that is if you need to start inserting nodes or rerouting fiber, then of course we have to do some re-engineering because the network's different. But if the network basically stays the same, uh, then uh, generally there's there's no re-engineering necessary. Right? It's very very rare for that to happen. Uh, this is what it uh, ends up looking like. So this is a three degree Rotom site. Um, again, there's no quiz here for you. This is simply uh, what our internal design tool looks like. Uh, every element is, is considered here and then this all gets translated into a bill of materials, right? That then goes to a uh, quote and then gets handed off to the installation engineers and then they use this to, to do the installation, right? Uh, these are some of the elements on the right hand side, some of the things that we think about when we're designing a network. Of course, we're always looking at cost, right? We are always trying to suppress cost, um, uh, uh, except uh, where we are looking at uh, efficiency and, uh, and utility of the network, of course. But the, you know, for the, the, uh, the least cost is what we're always looking for. So, these are some of the things that we look at. Certainly scalability and flexibility for the future are important. Whenever we build a network for you, uh, we expect it will be in your network uh, and, and, uh, and operating and providing value for at least 10 years, right? Well, so we don't wanna build a network that's not gonna scale uh, and, uh, and flex to, to handle traffic uh, and traffic needs that are going to come out in six, seven, eight years, right? Um, it's not, it's not uh, absolutely known what we're going to see seven or eight years from now, but we can make some educated guesses, and that's uh, that goes into our design uh, our design processes. So uh, we've been talking about DWDM design. Uh, we have not talked about layer two and layer three that we're going to cover in a future tech talk. Matter of fact, it, it's the very next one. What I want you to take away from this diagram is layer one uh, optical design, as I've been discussing, is typically the most cost efficient way to move data from one location to another. There are a number of reasons for that. I've covered some of those in terms of uh, efficiencies and dealing with uh, with your customers. Uh, the cost triangle on the left-hand side is a mnemonic to keep in mind when you are designing a network and considering what type of services you want to offer. Um, the cost arrow at the top uh, is, is indicating that the wider that triangle, the more it's going to cost you to handle your traffic at that layer. So routers, 
Uh, everybody's familiar with routers. They're great. They do what routers do. They can do virtually anything in the network. Would you ever build a network entirely of routers at layer three? Very rarely because it's so expensive, right? There typically are uh, operations in the network that can be handled at a lower layer, layer two and particularly layer one, uh, where you are moving data much more cost effectively, okay? So uh, a, an optical layer can really supercharge a layer two, layer three network providing uh, not just cost efficiencies, but uh, but uh, transport efficiencies, right? Really uh, being a force multiplier for your uh, existing enterprise. A lot, of, uh, a lot of networks out there were built with uh, layer two switches all the way around. You know, the, the sort of ubiquitous ERPS ring, uh, which is providing that failover, uh, but it was built at 10 gig as a backbone and now you've outgrown it, right? Well, even if you build that at 100 gig, uh, what happens when you get to 101 gig, right? Uh, you've got to go out and forklift cards and put new optics in, very, very expensive. The optical layer is designed to be scalable so that you can leave those 100 gigs in place and then add another 100 gig and add a 200 and another one and another one and another one and another one and so on, right? 400 gig, 600 gig. Uh, we have a 1.2 terabit laser coming out after the first of the year. So one channel will be running 1.2 terabit. This scalability is only available within a DWDM layer, right? Uh, a packet or routing layer is, is, is limited by uh, the one optic that you have in there. Okay, a uh, good example here, I used this last time. Uh, this is Georgia Transmission, uh, one of our longtime customers. They have a statewide network that provides uh, a backbone for residential broadband, wireless backhaul. Uh, they lease waves uh, to, uh, to uh, larger providers or nearby providers. Uh, it's all layer one. It's all built using the technology that I've been described, describing here. Um, it's very efficient, extraordinarily reliable, and as you can see, it covers the entire state of Georgia. So I can go from one end to the other, from Jacksonville, Florida, all the way up to Atlanta without having to stop and regenerate. Uh, the other benefit is extraordinarily low latency because we never drop off to a CPU or memory or any other type of hardware. It stays optical the whole way. Uh, and uh, so very, very efficient uh, to cover very large areas. Uh, uh, in addition to uh, the scalability and, and reliability. Okay, so uh, that is a very quick uh, DWDM uh, 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 primer, if you will. Um, any questions, uh, more than happy to answer those. Uh, I know I have Drew standing by to help answer those. Um, we're gonna be sending this uh, presentation out to you uh, as well. Uh, so you can look through it. Uh, feel free to respond to us with any questions or uh, if you have a need uh, and you think DWDM might be able to fulfill it, uh, then we're certainly happy to talk to you. Uh, in summary, uh, you know, our solutions uh, as we describe them uh, under our IP wave portfolio uh, are all standards based. Uh, it's all based in, in, uh, in solid industry standards for both our IP uh, packet and optical solutions. Um, we are extraordinarily widely uh, uh, deployed, right? The, the, some of the largest carriers in the world are using this technology. Uh, literally hundreds of millions of end, end users are running across uh, ribbon equipment today, including some of the largest uh, defense agencies uh, out there. Uh, we do not charge uh, licensing fees on an annual basis. Uh, we do not have a subscription uh, type model. Once you buy our software, it's yours. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and so you won't ever get a PO, uh, excuse me, an invoice for, uh, for relicensing our software. Uh, we like to go, in, we like to build in a pay-as-you-grow model. This basically means it's a low cost of entry up front uh, and you only pay for the hardware and software as you need it, 
right? If you don't need it, then you don't pay for it. Uh, we are Buy America Act compliant. Uh, in these days of a large public investment, uh, you know, with grants and loan guarantees and so forth uh, coming out of the federal government uh, to bridge the digital divide, uh, a long time coming, if you ask me. Uh, we are uh, Buy America compliant, so you will be able to, to answer yes. Uh, when you respond to, to the USDA and RUS. And currently we are delivering everything in our portfolio uh, within a 10 to 12 week uh, window. Uh, the supply chain issues that, uh, that are talked about so often on the news are, um, are so far unaffecting us. Uh, and that's the result of, of good planning, quite frankly. All right, so next on uh, Ribbon Tech Talks, we're gonna move up the stack and we're gonna talk about IP and ethernet strategies for rural networks. Um, you know, a lot of these strategies are, a lot of the, the protocols and, uh, uh, and uh, stacks and so forth, the methodologies for data transmission are applicable to everyone from the very smallest provider all the way up to the largest in the world. But there are some fairly unique strategies uh, that we regularly employ for rural uh, telecom and utelco providers. Um, and so we'll be talking about those uh, next time. Uh, that'll be, and I, I apologize, I have got the wrong date on there. It's actually uh, August 29th. August 29th. September That's correct, 30th. Jack. It's uh, 11 a.m. Yeah. Eastern time on Monday, August 29th. That's correct. And your, your reminder emails that you get from the system uh, will have that correct time and date on there as well. And then finally, uh, I wanna give a shout out uh, to our Tech Forum folks. Uh, we are hosting our 2022 Tech Forum uh, at the Weston Galleria in Dallas, Texas later this year. Uh, it's uh, technically gonna start on November 1st. There is a golf outing. Uh, you will see that uh, when you register. Uh, the technical content is going to take place on November 2nd and 3rd, uh, again at the Weston Galleria, which is a beautiful facility centrally located in northern Dallas. Uh, very quick uh, to get to from uh, DFW Airport um, and uh, actually not all that far from Ribbon Headquarters. Uh, we're going to have product demos of uh, hardware and software. Uh, we're going to have multiple sessions uh, where not just ribbon experts, but industry experts, uh, some of you, uh, depending on who's, who's on this call, some of you may have already been asked to be on panels. Uh, so we really want to make it a conversation between uh, the ribbon folks uh, and uh, those of you that, uh, that we serve uh, with our products and solutions. Uh, all of our executives will also be there. So if you want to pin one of our uh, VPs uh, or, or the CEO down, then uh, there's an opportunity to do that. Uh, registration is now open. The link is there on my screen, uh, learn.rbbn.com forward slash tech forum 22. And we hope to see you all there. And with that, Lance, I am done, so I'll hand it back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Appreciate that. And uh, sure. Elizabeth did put all those details in the chat window as well. So if you take a look at that, you should see the link. You can click right on it. And you probably can click on your screen to that link as well. But, uh, we do look forward to seeing you all there at the event. Uh, we did have a couple questions, Jack and Drew and Elizabeth, if you're still on. Um, I'm just going to run through two or three of them here. Um, when you deploy a FOTUM, or when do you deploy a FOTUM versus a Rotom network? Like what, what would should be your deciding factors there? So yeah, great question. So uh, it, it depends on uh, your, it really comes down to your traffic patterns, right? So the, the, the main difference with a FOTUM is that you're just looking at a passive filter. So traffic will come in optically over your outside plant. It'll hit that FOTUM and then it'll break out to discrete wavelengths, okay? And, and it really doesn't have any other choice than that. It's a passive uh, solution. Uh, it's less expensive, uh, but it's dropping all that traffic at virtually every site, okay? A Rotom 
is a smarter network in that it actually is detecting that traffic coming in and, and deciding, does this traffic drop here or does it continue through? So the simple answer to your question is, uh, what is your traffic pattern? If you have a ring, uh, I'll say as an example, and it's got six sites on it and you are needing to add and drop traffic at every single site and you have no traffic that needs to pass all the way through and skip sites, then that's a Fotom design, right? A Rotom won't do you much good there. Uh, a Rotom is helpful where you have that very same ring and you have six sites on it, but one of those is a hub site and it communicates in a logical hub and spoke with all of the other sites. So site A is the hub, B, C, D, and E are all the, the spokes. And each one of those sites communicates back, back to A. Well, so, but not to its fellows, right? So what that means is if I'm at A, I'm gonna, I'm gonna oh, excuse me, if I'm at B, I'm gonna connect to A, but then around the other side of the ring, I'm gonna pass through C, D, E, and F before I get back to A, okay? And I don't wanna drop at those sites. I'm B site traffic, all I need to talk to is the hub at A. So if I need to pass through, that's where a Rotom comes in handy, right? There are other benefits as well, as I mentioned, that Rotoms uh, handle all of the uh, optical physics, if you will. They handle all of the optical adjustments that need to take place, uh, particularly when you're adding new channels. Uh, and, th and that's certainly administrative benefit. Um, but the primary, the primary reason we would go Fotom over Rotom is if your traffic pattern requires that you add and drop at every location and there is no continue, right? Uh, so. All right, perfect. Thank you for that. Um, we had a couple more, and actually Drew answered this on the on the chat session, so you can see it in the chat record. But um, maybe you can answer it verbally as well, or Drew, you can jump on to answer this verbally for the rest of the audience. How are coherent optics different from other optics? So the biggest difference is the light signal that gets sent uh, into the the fiber. Uh, your typical like what we call a gray wave optic is. It doesn't send everything necessarily in phase like a coherent light signal, and it doesn't, you know, even though it sits at a wavelength, it's not designed to be in a a muxed or or combined DWDM network. So you know, you'll see ZR and ER optics that operate in that 1550 nanometer range, which sits squarely in the C band, but it's still not a DWDM coherent optic. The 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 wavelengths are just not in the same sort of phase. So with coherent, you've got optics that are tunable to a specific frequency within or channel within that DWDM range that you can use to go in and out of your muxes or, or in and out of your rotoms directly, depending on how you've designed the network. They also typically have a little bit higher launch power uh, to be able to overcome the insertion loss of things like muxes and rotoms. Okay, very good. Um, and we had one other one here. Uh, it's sort of a comment and a question. 10G cell tower site transport is coming fast. Uh, so would you recommend using Apollo transport as far as possible before handing off uh, IP to carriers to alleviate the overhead or SLA items? Yeah, yeah. So uh, again, it always depends, right? That there's the typical engineering out, right? Um, there, there's always a caveat there, but but in a lot of uh, uh, in a lot of environments, uh, using that optical transport uh, from uh, from a cell tower uh, to a hub site uh, can make sense. Uh, honestly, it's it's fairly infrequent that we see that though. Usually you'll see layer two transport from the cell site, cell site router or switch uh, to a hub site. And then when all of that traffic is aggregated, uh, then, uh, then that's when it, it uh, makes sense to start putting it on an optical backbone. Uh, we have a customer uh, uh, that has very large uh, deployment, over 1,100 towers out in the Western United States. 
uh, and we provide the primary backbone for all of those towers. So we are not providing uh, Apollo layer one traffic uh, handling all the way out to the base of the tower. We are taking that layer two traffic in uh, at a hub site, but then the backbone itself uh, is uh, 48 times 400 capable uh, backbone that stretches over uh, well over 150 shelves at this point uh, and about 2,000 kilometers of lit fiber. Uh, so in those environments, that's where that scalability, also the distances, you know, I'm out here in the Western US, um, it's a long way from here to there, <laughs> out here, right, in the big square states. Um, and so when you have to shoot 80, 90, 100 kilometers, uh, that's where DWDM light starts making sense as well, because we can amplify it. Uh, you can't amplify the gray wave light. Uh, it, it um, you know, the gray wave uh, light, the non-coherent light, uh, makes sense for short runs um, and for point-to-point -point runs, um, uh, typically out to a client site. Uh, but when you need scalability, distance, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, flexibility, then that's where that's where we start using coherent light and DWM. Sure, and it often depends, right, whether you're whether you've got lots of pairs of fiber on that path, right? If if it's if it's something that you've installed a 144 count on and and you can just burn another pair of fibers for another gray wave optic, that that's great. But if you're you've got an IRU or you're leasing a pair of fibers and and doubling that would be a very expensive proposition, especially on a on a like a monthly or, or recurring cost basis. Uh, it can often make sense to just utilize more and more channels on the individual piece of individual pairs of fiber. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Jack, Drew. Um, and final one here, and this will kind of be a good one to end on, is um, what's the any or any best practices you might have on managing, you know, fiber health? Uh, any tips? Yeah, uh, Drew, Drew, you want to take that one? Sure. So, you know, usually when you have to when you have a fiber problem or you have uh, you know you get a trouble call because you've got a circuit down. Uh, the first thing that's typically done is, is a, someone's got to drive out there with an OTDR, uh, plug into one end of the circuit, you know, do the OTDR trace and see, you know, where where is this problem at, uh, you know, and, and then they've got to, you know, compare that on the map. What is 37.5 kilometers from here? Is it an aerial span? Is it in a manhole? Is it, in, you know, what's going on? And you know, oftentimes you can drive out and you find Joe Backhoe is 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 out there doing doing you a, a favor. Uh, but one of the things that we we can do in the Apollo system is actually have an OTDR integrated into the, the system that runs in line with your traffic. It runs at a completely separate wavelength than the C-band. Uh, we, uh, we've got them that run in the 1610 nanometer range as well as the 1625, depending on if it's C plus L or just C-band traffic. And, and we've has seen a lot of success with this where it just saves that truck roll, right? Whenever you've got a, a fiber cut or, or an event that breaches a threshold that you've set in the system, it will automatically run this non-intrusive OTDR test on your fiber and, and tell you, you know, here's where I think your problem is. And, and with our, our LightSoft and Muse systems, you can actually integrate a map into it that will give you the, you know, the location based on distance of where it thinks that your fiber problem is at. So, you know, a couple of couple of problems and, and, you know, the truck rolls and the time you've saved can really be help that system pay off and that, you know, that you can use it to constantly monitor as well. Right. So it can run daily or, or, or whatever cadence you want tests and then sort of keep track if you have a rapidly degrading pair of fibers or if there's a micro bend or, you know, Jack likes to tell a story of a customer that had some direct buried fiber under a street that as as trucks rolled over it more and more, the dispersion got worse and worse as as the the circular core flattened into an oval. And it did a very good job of finding that as it happened. Thanks, Drew. All right, well, we uh, definitely went a little longer, but it's really good discussion. So thank you all for your questions. Uh, we do appreciate that. Uh, again, just a quick reminder, Ribbon Tech Forum on your screen, November 2nd through 3rd. Please check out that link and, and uh, register for that event. We'd love to see you there. The next webinar in this series is Monday, August 29th, uh, IP and Ethernet Strategies for the Rural Market. 
So please uh, check that out. You're also already registered for that. So uh, you don't have to do anything but show up on Monday. Um, and we really appreciate it. So look for an uh, email later today with a link to this replay, as well as a link to the slides. If you have any additional questions, feel free to respond to that email. Obviously, ribboncommunications.com. Use contact us fields to ask us any questions at any time. We do track all of those and manage those for you. So we will get back to you. Uh, but I really appreciate everybody's time. Jack, any final words before we sign off? No, I appreciate your time this morning. Uh, a great conversation, great questions, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Have a great day.